it is a mystery. I, I don't know why this happens, but it does. And this is kind of the cool part of art making and the, and the piece that got me really interested in journey and path. I mean, I only get to do this once, but by participating and seeing and coaching and being part of others, I get to see how all these sort of magical moments align and pile up to create a direction, to create powerful, amazing art. So today I'm talking about one of the most important pieces for making your art. Oddly, understanding how to mix colors, perfect brush strokes, or understanding texture, design, those aren't actually the most important pieces of making successful art. Making art that's potent, personal, inspiring. That part comes from you. And that part isn't entirely visible at first. In fact, the whole process of finding our way and finding our way towards art that is like ourselves, that we love, that connects with other people, is the journey. Art making is the process of becoming yourself. And today I want to talk about that process of finding our way, wayfinding. How? How do we do this? How do we stay in the groove of discovering and staying engaged and actually ending up in a place that is better than where we were before? I hope you can take a few minutes while you're making your art and have a listen. I think it might be helpful. These are the things I tell myself when I get stuck, when things slow down and I start to lose my way. This is what brings me back to the surface. Welcome to Art to Life, a podcast for the creatively curious. My name is Nicholas Wilton, and each week I'll help you rediscover not just the art of your life, but the art in your life. Join me as we explore that perfect blue at twilight, the wild frontiers of art making, and the extraordinary joy of finding your way as you go. So one thing I always wanted to have growing up was a dog. And I never could have one. My parents, just for whatever reason, never allowed that. I could have fish, you know, I had lizards, and I think I even had a snake at one point, my sister got a parrot, but a dog was just too much. And I just wanted one so bad. And I always borrowed uh, neighborhood dogs and befriended them and fed them. And they ended up <laughs> kind of hanging out with me more than the owners, but I never got one. I always wanted one. And then, then that kind of faded. And the desire to get a dog kind of reemerged when my kids started wanting a dog. My two daughters, they were about seven and nine, I think, wanted a dog. And of course, just probably out of a pattern, I, I just said no. <laughs> you know, I didn't want, I didn't, it was, you know, this is so much responsibility. I mean, it was the same reasons that my parents gave me, you know, you're, you won't feed it. You're not here. There are too much responsibility and they're going to take care of it. And I said the same thing. And I remember that chapter of my life. I was really pretty stressed out trying to survive as an illustrator and working really, really hard. And it's just the thought of one more thing, plus these kids with all their programs and driving them to school and food and all the things kind of precluded the idea. So I just kept putting it off and putting it off. And But over time, the idea of a pet, of a dog, you know, I started to entertain the idea that this could be something that <laughs> might be a positive thing, maybe. And I, it kind of coincided with things started to get better. My career was doing better. I wasn't so worried about the projects that would, would stop, you know, that I would run out of jobs because I was a freelance illustrator, you know, but I was, I could feel it. It was like people were finding out about my work and, and, uh, I was just in a, in an easier place, more, I was having more fun. I had a bit more time off. And uh, I was, things were going good. So I had, with that spaciousness came this idea that, well, maybe I could, you know, maybe I could give 
to my kids a dog. Maybe that's something. And I mean, I didn't tell them because if, if I, you know, gave in at all, they would just, you know, go crazy. I just, I could feel that there was the possibility of a dog. <laughs> And around this time, I was approached by uh, a dog food company, actually, a new dog food company. It was called Lotus. And it was this, they contacted me to do this packaging. And their idea, they sent me these sketches, and their idea was to have a, a dog uh, on the package. So let's say it was adult dog food. You know, it's not just you know, nowadays, you know, there's different kinds of food for all the different ages of your dog. And so for the senior dog food, the older dog, you know, the retired dog, they thought the idea of doing dogs playing chess would be a cool image. And, you know, this was so far away from the kind of work that I was doing. I, I was more interested in, I was doing more like serious book covers and I had just done the Paulo Coelho's book cover, really sort of symbolic and mystical and a little darker. To be approached to do almost like a cartoony thing, I don't know why they contacted me. There was just enough interest because I was kind of thinking about dogs a lot at that time. And I just, it was silly. The whole idea was silly. The young dog, it was dogs flying a kite and the duck-based dog food was a dog in a bathtub full of rubber ducks. And I mean, it was just, it was just silly. And there was not really, they didn't, they just needed it done really quickly, which often is a good sign because I could just do this. But I just, I said, yes, for some reason I said, okay, I'll do this. This is just so silly. And I thought maybe it'd be a kind of a break from the seriousness of, of what I have been making normally. And just why not do some like kitty kind of children's booky dog things. So I did these dog packages and they were not like any other dog food. This company's dog food packages ended up, they're almost like folk art dogs and, you know, packaging. And, and there was nothing like it. There still is nothing like it on the market. And, and I, I was sort of impressed that they, they were going to go for it. Most dog food packages look like a, they look like science bags of stuff. I mean, most of them want to prove scientifically that their food is beneficial for bones and teeth. And there's just this kind of quality to them that is really unappealing. It's just something I've noticed about dog food. But this Lotus dog food was really fun. And I managed to create these dogs in a way that was, I didn't do it like a cutesy dog. I decided to do them more like how I would want it to feel, which was more sophisticated. Like these dogs had some kind of attitude and they were well-educated dogs and they discussed books and went to movies. And in my mind, this was sort of how I pictured this dog, that it was just a sensitive creature. And anyway, I made these dogs and the packaging and the company and the whole thing kind of took off. And it was crazy that people started buying this stuff. It was really, really expensive. And it was, it's a very good food, you know, highly organic and it's not, there's no preservatives in it. So you, they can't spray um, chicken fat on the food to make the dogs eat it because it'll go rancid. It has to, it's like, it's a baked food. And they went through all this testing and made sure nine out of dogs would eat it. But it was a hard road for this company to make an amazing, healthy dog food that dogs would eat. So it takes off. And then I end up doing more of these things. And I end up getting, they give me a contract. I'm being paid a certain amount every single month to do these packaging. And this thing's just going crazy. And I become like the guy who's making this, the, the dogs, they're all there and they're all made up. I wasn't looking at any photographs. I just drew a, a dog that felt like a dog, maybe like how I would be a dog. And so it wasn't like a golden lab or anything. I, I don't, I never had a dog. I wouldn't even know that. I just stylized this thing and made it up out of my head. I made it different colors. So there was different, different characters, but basically it was this kind of dog. And around this time, I was continuing to soften to the idea and we decided to go for it to get a dog for the kids. And my wife at the time went online and, you know, you, you, you start going down this road and there's all kinds of possibilities of animals that 
are needing love and home and found one and it seemed good or I don't, I'm not sure why we chose that one, but we did. And we went up to the place and we got this dog and her name was Daisy. And we immediately thought Daisy was too cute and, and changed it to Maisie. And this dog was amazing and really beautiful and so gentle. And she's in my studio and I'm working on these dog food packaging. And she, she sort of glommed onto me fairly quickly because I was working at home and I would take her running and she, you know, unbeknownst to me at that time, I didn't realize that dogs kind of choose a person in the family to kind of pal around with. And she chose me. And, you know, and I think it was because I ran and I'm, I was the tallest one. Or I'm not sure. The kids, we all loved her equally and she loved us all the same. But nonetheless, she sat at my feet forevermore making art. And I realized when I started getting the proofs of these packages back that the dog <laughs> that I had been drawing all these years, you know, it was, it was like, a, you know, I probably had done seven or eight packages before we got Maisie, was actually Maisie. I mean, it's not even contested. This dog on these packages was Maisie. And people would see my dog and I would go into the stores and they would say, oh my God, it's the Lotus dog, you know. But it was just something that was a harder thing to explain to people that I actually didn't have the dog when I made the packages. That This sort of warping of time, this thing came about in a different order. And it's just sort of an amazing example for me, one of many examples of me of what, of when you're thinking about something that's in your consciousness and then sometimes evidence of it or possible versions of it actually occur. It was the process of thinking about this dog, of getting a dog that I believe and understand now that invited in, if you, you know, want to be wooey about it, a project about a dog that was completely unlike any work I'd ever done. And I just happened to be in a, in a more open, spacious, kind of more playful, like more ready for a dog than I'd ever been, you know, kind of feeling like, well, yeah, this could be, this could be fun. You know, I could, I have time. I could take it for a walk and, you know, maybe it would run with me or, you know, the kids would love it. And, and, you know, I never had a dog, but maybe because they're going to get one, it would be, it would be amazing because that would be a piece of their childhood and all the things that bring, dogs bring that I now know. That all aligned, that awareness that brought that project in, that moved me further along to this idea of a dog. And then we got the dog, <laughs> you know, and it's the same dog that I conjured up for this packaging. This synchronicity, I, th I think is a word, you know, that was it was coined by Carl Jung, the psychologist. It talks about deeply meaningful coincidences, which mysteriously occur in your life. It's a mystery. It's a wonder. I, I don't, I don't understand this. I just observe it. And it relates a lot, a lot, a lot to making and finding our way in our art. The idea here that I'm talking about, and I know most of you thought about this, but I'm sharing it again today as a possible reminder to, to use this, that this idea of wayfinding, you know, the, this process or activity of, or of ascertaining your position and planning or following a direction, a route via signs, you know, wayfinding, that occurs in this sort of mysterious way. It occurs when we start to think about where we want to go. And the tricky thing with art making and, and where we, the disconnect is, and is that we don't, we shouldn't actually know clearly where we're going or what we're doing. I mean, that's this whole idea of the creative path that, you know, David Hockney is finding his way, but it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to look at where he's been going and follow that because I'm not David Hockney, right? You know, I'm just, my own person and you're just your person. So the idea here, the, the hard part that I end up helping a lot of artists with is how do you get direction if you don't know where you're going? 
Uh, what I'm saying here is that you get direction by just starting, just getting a sense of what it is you're after. I use the phrase feels like a lot because feeling, if something feels like, what is this dog that I'm going to do a picture of? What, what's it supposed to feel like for me? What would feel right? What would this dog feel like? And I don't know what breed it is. I don't know what color it is, but well, it's not going to be like a stupid dog that just eats all the time. It's going to be a dog. I mean, this is me personally, what I would like in a dog, you know, which I ended up getting, by the way, a dog that it has a look that it has a far bigger intelligence than other dogs that it doesn't need to pester you all the time and that it's quite happy to sit and just think about things and enjoy itself and and it's smart and it it's you know it doesn't just eat like a maniac that it has discernment i mean maybe this is we project who we want to be on our dogs i'm not sure but this idea of what does the thing feel like in our art what is it that your art wants to feel like or what feels to you, and I talked about this, this idea of coming alive in the first episode of this podcast, you know, that that is a really great indication of how it should feel for you. What has some juice? What has some energy? And if you can pick on a few things and be thinking about that, having some sense of that as you go about your day, then it becomes possible that you will notice things that align with where you're trying to go. You are interested in painting seagulls, <laughs> you know, and you pin them up on your wall or you see birds when you go to your car. You know, it's like you start becoming aware. It's like when you become a, someone tells you a new word that you've never heard of. And then that week you hear it like three or four times. I think this thing where people are saying, oh my God, it's, a, it's 11, it's 11, 11 again. They're looking at their phone. That's the same thing. Like you have this awareness, a sensitivity to a certain time of day and you're just on it and you're noticing it and you hit it. I mean, it's, it is a mystery. I, I don't know why this happens, but it does. And this is kind of a cool part of art making and the, and the piece that got me really interested in journey and path. I mean, I only get to do this once, but by participating and seeing and coaching and being part of others, I get to see how all these sort of magical moments align and pile up to create a direction, to create powerful, amazing art. What's so cool about this idea, especially for artists, is that if you can kind of get in this state and I'm going to talk in a minute about how to get in this state. But if you can, if you can have an awareness of the thing that's important to you, the things that are important to you and be thinking about what they are or what they even feel like, you will start noticing just quite organically, quite by accident in your life, other things that feel like that, that can add to illuminate more, contribute to the momentum and the direction of the thing you want to make. And it provides clarity. And it it's an iteration. Your art making, your thing, your amazing art that's coming is an iteration. It's a little half step this direction and then over here and then move there and here and someone says something and you meet somebody and then you pick up this and you find that. And the results of this practice and this wayfinding idea, this is a practice, this presence results in your art and it results in art that's improving and becoming more and more like you. And when your art becomes new and different, and if it's like you, it is. And I, this idea of differences, I talk a lot about in episode two. So if this, you know, I, I'm not going to go into it here, but feeling alive comes from from people discovering things that are new and different. And that will be your artwork. You know, this dog food packaging was partly 
successful because it looked new and different, right? Like that's, it's, what is this? This is new. I haven't, you know, and it, and it attracts those people that are sort of thinking of these things and, and they're attracted to it. And that's what a fan is, you know, a fan or someone who just doubles down on, on your artwork from the very beginning, they have a vested interest in what you're making because it, it resonates with them. They are connecting to what you're doing because for them, it fulfills part of something that they're looking for. And so that's a really cool way. It's like a fellow traveler in this, a journey, fellow person that is, that's connecting to your, to what you're making. So how do we know? How do we stay? You know, what's the sign that we're in a good mode on this? Well, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, I'm probably butchering his pronunciation. He was the founder of positive psychology and he, he's the one who coined the word flow. And he described it as a state in which people are so involved in an activity that nothing else seems to matter. And, and the, the experience is like, it's super enjoyable and they just kind of keep doing it. This is the state, if your thinking's right, if you're present and you're getting information and you're getting stimulation from the outside and the inside of yourself and you're feeling inspired, and this is happening to you, well, you're already doing this. This is how flow is created, is that there's this abundance of aliveness that you're responding to and your work is changing and shifting and you're liking it and it relates to what you like and it feels like you. And it is so engaging, as most of you know, it is hard to do sometimes, you know, because there's a lots of distractions and other kinds of things that block us from this state. But this idea of connecting to what brings you joy, figuring out what that feels like, whether it's something in your art or something in your life, what you need is the freedom to the space to kind of think about those things. And it won't come from any other place or person, nobody has the sort of the right mix of things that you need to make your art. It isn't, it isn't purchasable. It isn't sitting out there all laid out. You have to follow these breadcrumbs and create your own mix of all the things that will help, will help you find your way. So if you have that flow state, which is where we're trying to go, where you feel present, and your work is going great, you know, that you like what you're making. If this is possible, and it is, and you can learn to get in this place and understand where you're going a little bit more and be okay with not entirely knowing totally where you're going, then you're going to show up and do your art more and your art's going to be better and your art's going to be made more easily. And I would argue that it will relate to people, it will connect to people more. I mean, this thing that I'm talking about, like having this piece working for you is the most important thing in art on how to do this, how to really get this practice going and how to really make a difference with, with your work to put it out there. I mean, first you have to satisfy yourself. You've got to find a way to really get into this and not just like for a couple days, but generally speaking for your life. And that's what we're after. This is a huge piece of living and having a successful art life. I mean, successful meaning that it's fulfilling and that it matters to you and that it connects to other people. Most importantly, I, I want to just touch upon a few things that can block this conversation or you're noticing the wrong things, <laughs> you know, like we're trying to figure something out and where things are coming through our universe that are actually taking us in different directions that maybe aren't aligned for us. So first one is just, I mean, I'm preaching to myself here because this is for me the most important one. And, and that's just not having space or room in my life to pay attention. And when you're not paying attention, those things keep coming, but you miss them. 
There's clues every day and the universe is sending you if you're messaging it correctly. And if you're too busy, they just go right by you. That project, I would not have said, if I was busy and harried and not available emotionally or had no space in my life, I would have said no, absolutely, to that kind of project, to that dog food packaging. First, it's kind of, it's kind of embarrassing, like doing dog food packaging. You know, I, I was really thinking of myself as, you know, someone doing book covers and more sophisticated things, you know, but I just was at a time in my life where I wasn't taking myself so seriously and things were lighter and I just had more time. And then I got to consider this thing and then I ended up saying yes to it. It's kind of our job as artists, you know, as a, if we're going to take that name to live in a place of this curiosity, to really get that we need to be living more spaciously. That it doesn't make sense to be a hairy, busy artist. And again, I'm the poster child for this, but I know from experience and, and coaching what happens when you can start paying attention and, it, and, and having room. So the other thing that can get in the way of this is not having an, like an attitude of openness. If your thinking's too small, right, then we can't expand. And, and what we're talking about, the journey, the creative path is an expansion. It's going from a smaller state to a more expansive state. It's going from a the bud opening into a flower. That's the journey. That's the possibility, the invitation. And, and we get to showcase this by our art. We're also doing this, hopefully, in our lives and in our relationships and on all the other things. But Art is a little easier because there's evidence, there's artifacts of our progress. So if your thinking's too small and, you know, well, my, this isn't possible for me, or if you're focused on how something has to turn out and this is the kind of artist I am, if I stuck to my guns about the kind of illustrator I was and said, no, I'm not going to do something that's a little different because I'm this certain thing. I would have said no in this whole podcast episode and this dog and all the rest of it and the incredible, I mean, the life and joy and love that that dog brought into all of our lives. I ran hundreds of miles with this animal. I mean, she changed my life. And I know many of you have seen Maisie. She's recently passed, but she was just the most incredible dog and pet. And I still can't get another one because I cannot imagine. <laughs> my thinking is still pretty small because I cannot imagine another dog as amazing as her. And I know that's just a natural thing that happens when you lose a pet. But if we're focused on an outcome, you, you really can shortchange what might possibly occur. You get what you focus on. And this is really a common idea, but it's really, really true that if you can focus, if you just partially focus, even have an awareness of what you want, where are you going, or the colors you want to use, or the place you want to make your art even, all of those things are things you can focus on and start thinking about. I mean, this doesn't take any money here. This isn't like, wait till I have the resources so I can live in Mallorca with a studio over the ocean. This comes about, these things come about by focusing, by thinking a little bit. That's how these things happen. It's, it's not how we think it happens in the movies where you win the lottery. That's not how this goes. And it's far less interesting if it goes that way anyway. You want to follow this path of serendipity and starting your own concoction of ideas and thoughts and beliefs and openness. This process improves you as an artist. Getting that you can sort of manifest a little bit things that can help you move towards what it is that it feels like where you want to go, even if you don't know particularly exactly where you want to go, that it's still open. And I, and I think that's the most perfect way it should be, that it, you don't want to know the outcome. As soon as you know the outcome, it changes the way you get there and all the things that occur. And that's not as fun, <laughs> you know, because there's, there's no wonder in it. Another thing that I see a lot with working with people and all of these things I've struggled with myself are 
when we're in a patch, when we're feeling at odds with the world, like, you know, feeling like the world and the hard things that they're just happening to you, you're a little bit of a victim, you know, and you're not being present, you know. It is ridiculous that we can think that, well, this day, Wednesday, because I got a flat tire and then my daughter called me with bad news, is just a bad day. The whole thing just is a bad day. And anything that happens in this day is not going to work out. And actually now there's two of them and three of them in a row. Now I'm having a bad week and now there's a bad month and this whole year sucked, you know. This kind of thinking, again, it's predetermined. We've already decided that this negative sort of pool that we're sitting in by ourselves isn't very good. And trust me, you know, the universe and whatever that angel is, they, they really don't want to bother with people in those situations so much. It's, it's really incumbent on us to get ourselves ready to receive something that is possible. And and I think keeping that idea of that there's a possibility that you're open to things, that it's not all set, you know, that, that your days aren't all aligned in one particular way, that each day brings new possibilities. I mean, it's so easy to forget this. And then, of course, of course, of course, there's this idea that we don't deserve what we desire, that we can't conjure things up a little bit. There's a cynicism. And these are handed to us, of course. They're limiting beliefs that are passed down from parents that think artists are starving and we shouldn't be involved or we're untalented or... These limiting beliefs are really, really important. Uh, in, in all my programs and courses, this is the first order of the day. Nothing can happen <laughs> when these are, are floating around. I mean, they're always floating around a little bit, uh, of course. But if it's, if it's really coloring your experience, if you really, really believe that you don't have talent and you're trying to do this thing and you just feel like an imposter and any little thing will throw you into uncertainty about the possibility for yourself. You need to get coaching. You need to work with people that can prove otherwise because that isn't a truth. That's a lie. These limiting beliefs are not real. They're made up and they're not true. <laughs> you know, this is an easy one. It's like, if I was trying to tell you that gravity doesn't exist. Well, you know, maybe we could debate it a little, but you know, limiting beliefs are absolutely false and they block. They can block this conversation and the possibilities that can occur because of it. The fifth thing that I want to mention here, you know, is this idea that most of the time are forgetting this idea that the odds are stacked in our favor. The vast majority of things that are occurring with people, whether you're on an airplane or trying to get directions in another country or in the store or all the things, 99% of all the things that we're involved in are positive. I mean, it's a freaking miracle, you know, how friendly people are. And, and yes, you know, my daughter just got her catalytic converter ripped out from underneath her car, you know, because they're worth so much. And she left her car parked in San Francisco. And it's a bummer, you know, and it's like, that's a not a positive thing, you know, but they become almost like exceptional news because they so rarely happen. And they do happen, of course. But remember that this experience we're having is so, so positive and that the present person who has a vestige of positivity lurking within them is going to receive more easily information, opportunities, uh, synchronicities, things that provide them a tailwind in the direction which lights them up, providing it's a direction that hasn't been imposed upon them by you know, by, by a parent or, 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 or a should. I'm talking only about what truly, truly matters to you, whether it's your art or anything else. What I love about this subject and the fact that it's connected to art is that art teaches us this process. We get to improve at doing this because we're artists. I mean, I think this is really the definition of what an artist is, is somebody who is connected to flow that is gathering information and is 
seeing the world in their own unique way, and they're committed to seeing the world in their own unique way, and they're sharing it, and they're giving permission for other people to wake up and see things differently and to become more and more aware of just this miracle that we're, we're flying around on this rock, you know? So the reason this is easier with, with art is because we can gauge our progress because there's an artifact and that's our art. The quality and vibrancy of what we make demonstrates to ourselves and those looking at our art how connected to all of this we are. This actually is how you make amazing kick-ass art. Like this is part of it. I would argue this is the most important part of it. And this is what I talk about mostly. And yes, you need to learn how to mix colors and you need to understand all the ins and outs of good design and value and texture, all those things. And I teach that and love that stuff, but it's, it's a tiny piece of what is involved compared to this idea, this wayfinding idea. When you can measure something, I can see my art getting better. Then I can stay in this game. It becomes really engaging because we can see our progress from a contracted space to an expansive space. Our art, generally speaking, now it doesn't always go this way, but it does on the, it's like the stock market. It kind of goes up and down and sometimes it really goes down. It never feels like it's going to go up. But generally speaking, it's going up, <laughs> you know, that's why everyone's involved in it. It is generally speaking, going up your art. If you are paying attention and you improving and you're liking your art more, that means you're paying attention. Your art will be getting better. And then we see that and that is a positive experience and super addicting and makes everything worthwhile. And that energy that we get from this experience is recycled back into the thing we're making. Generally speaking, you gain momentum with this process. You know, at a certain point, the art just starts becoming more and more personal until at some point we don't describe the art as a bull in a bull ring. We describe it as a Picasso because it's taken on, it's still of the world, but it's taken, it's become so, so personal. It's more about that person. It's Picasso. It's not the subject of what he chose to talk about. It's just Picasso. And it seems to me that, that that's that's what we're involved in. And that's the invitation. And, and it's so worthwhile and so exciting to be on this journey. So I, I hope that was helpful. And this is something I tell myself when things get hard, you know, that, oh yeah, no wonder it's been hard. I've just been way too busy. I haven't even remembered half these things that I know to be essential truths. So I hope this was, was helpful in, in you just remembering some of what I believe are essential truths about finding our path and that, that you can move forward. This is what is so interesting to me. And I, and I just love sharing with everyone. And if you have time, go back and if you haven't listened or go listen again to this idea of feeling alive and, and how that relates to what I'm sharing today, because it's the big clue as to what we need to be paying attention. So thanks so much for being here. If you can think of it, uh, please leave a review. But even more important, if, if you can share this with any artists you know, I would love you to do that and it would be really helpful. Thanks again. Super appreciate it. Okay. So I hope this was helpful. Uh, these are the things that I kind of remember always after a little too long um, when things aren't going well. And usually the indicator, the canary in the coal mine is my art and I can't drop into it. And then I start remembering these ideas, this essential truth about this path that we're on and how to stay on it and how to, how to optimize things, you know, how, how to stay in that state of flow. So I've got a few 
pictures and images if you want to check out uh, if you go to the website uh, I don't know where you're listening to this from but if you go to arttolife.com and check out the episode there's some photos of <laughs> the dog food packaging and Maisie and a few other things so anyway I hope this was helpful and I hope your day is really really great thanks hey thanks for listening to the Art to Life show if you enjoyed the podcast please help me get the word out by sharing it with your friends on Instagram at art to life underscore world the recording of this and all episodes along with a place to leave comments see additional photos and discover a whole new approach to making art can be found by going to arttolifepodcast.com. And secondly, if you could leave a rating and review and whatever app you're listening on today, I would super, super appreciate it. It makes a big difference. And last but not least, before you go, if you'd like to be on my artist list, every Sunday morning, I send out a video blog all about art making. Go to arttolifepodcast.com to sign up. And all these links are in the show notes, of course. Thanks so much for being here and we'll see you next week. Thank you.